Good evening, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Red Moon Roleplaying. This evening, once again, we are doing something a little different. Tonight, we are going to be playing a one-shot of a very interesting game. What is that game, I hear you ask? Well, perhaps I'll ask our first special guest and Game Master of the Evening, Neil Raymond Price. Good evening, Neil. How are you today? Good evening. I am very well, thank you. And, Neil... What are we playing today? We will be playing uh, Scion, a, a second edition by uh, Onyx Path Publishing. And we will be playing at the demigod level of play. Excellent, excellent. And for those who might not know, what, what is Scion? What, give us a little spiel. Scion second edition is about playing children of the gods in the modern day. The gods never went away. And their faiths are still all around us, and they still walk among us, uh, siring children and choosing them as they will. Um, the children of the gods fight a number of great and terrible enemies, mostly known as titans, but also some stranger and more intimate enemies of the gods. And as you progress through Scion, you can go from hero to demigod and then finally become a god yourself. Who doesn't want that? And who is joining us tonight to play this game? Well, first of all, our next special guest, none other than Chris, a.k.a. The Primogen. Good evening, Chris. How are you? Good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm doing quite great. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, as always. And who will you be playing tonight? Uh, I will be playing uh, Rashmi Bhattacharya, who is a chosen of Agni, one of the Indian gods, or actually the Indian god of fire. Oh, most exciting. And last but not least, once again, Jenny Bremberg. Jenny, hello, how are you this evening? Gokvel, maybe I should say, as I am playing Sigrun Askerdotter, uh, daughter of Loki, the trickster god of the Norse. Always good. And I myself, uh, this guy called Craig, some of you might know me, uh, I'm playing Emmanuel Montero, a well-to-do, stylish, rich young man, also the scion of a god whose name I'm not good at pronouncing. I'm going to try. Zutechichuli? Zuhektakutli. There you go. Completely wrong. It's a good thing I won't be saying it again. Gesundheit? <laughs> I don't need to say who my uh, father is. Come on. Everyone knows already. Um, but yes, I'm a little bit of a social character. We'll see how I get going. So, with that out of the way, Neil, please take us into this realm of gods and men. Certainly. <clears throat> it's hot in New York in the summer. The sun hangs in the air, eclipsed for onlookers by the towering skylines. It's hard to see the sun, but it's not hard to see faith. The city has eight and a half million people, a thousand different religions, and at least three demigods. You are all sitting in Emmanuel's spacious penthouse apartments on some impossibly tall building in New York City. Here, it's easy to see the sun, and it hangs low over the horizon, illuminating a few clouds with golden light. You're all enjoying a round of drinks, uh, mixed by expert mixologists that are on Emmanuel's staff. I currently am lounging back in a seat, smoking a fine cigar, drinking a fine drink, and enjoying that view. I do enjoy the sun. Reminds me a little bit of myself. I'm currently drinking a Vespa, most famously known as the Dry Martini, the one designed by James Bond. I find it a satisfying drink. It gets you drunk quickly, and after all, I don't like wasting my time. Mead, of course. That's what I'm drinking. Is there any other drink? drink of the gods. You're all making small talk, just general bits of chatter. It's a welcome respite from the heavy mythological imported matters that uh, you deal with almost every day. Additionally, as demigods, you all have your own admirers in the world. You all frequently trend on social media sites. People know your name as you walk down the street. It's a curious kind of celebrity because it literally, in this case, is celebrity worship. So here, you probably feel a little bit calmer and a little more normal 
the way you were before everything changed. And then a raven alights on the window, a proud and large specimen of its kind. It ruffles its feathers and greets you with a caw muffled from the windows. It pecks at the windows just a little bit, just peck, 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 peck. But, of course, these are penthouse windows, maybe the 60th floor, maybe higher, you're not entirely sure. And there's no real way to open them up here. Is there any balcony here? Can can we open that up and go out? Back in the back in them over? Certainly. Um, you beckon the raven over to the opposite side. You cross through Emmanuel's opulent bedroom. And you touch a panel on the wall, and a section of the glass slides out. And out you step onto a balcony. The raven flies around. It makes a lazy turn in the air and then alights again on the railing out here. The wind is a little cold despite the heat. You're pretty far up. It's a little hard to hear, but the raven looks at you, Sigrun. Do you bring word? Is that why you are here tonight? Well, I definitely bring a word, the raven says. Are you going to share it with us or... Do you want to come in? Uh, the raven sort of turns its head uh, a little bit at the uh, martini that um, <clears throat> that Rashmi still has and says, Do you have any of those little cocktail cherries? I'm sorry. Would you be more... Would you be fine with a slice of lemon peel? Otherwise, I can see if I can fetch something from the refrigerator. I guess so. He accepts your vodka-soaked lemon peel. And he goes, oh yeah, that's nice. Anyway, yes. Interesting. There's been word of your father. Apparently, Gulen Kambi, the rooster, has gone missing. So, uh, yeah, please give me an occult and intellect roll. Uh, difficulty, let's say two, just to remember who the Gulen Kambi is. Remember... Uh, target number is seven, so sevens and above are uh, successes. Two eights. So Gulen Kambi means golden comb in Old Norse. He's a rooster who lives in Valhalla. Uh, he is one of the three roosters whose crowing is foretold to signify the beginning of the events of Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods. Is he missing on his own volition, or...? Your father has gone missing as well, and as usual, uh, Odin suspects there's a connection there. I wouldn't be surprised if Loki tries to hurry things up a bit on his own, in his own ways. I guess, I guess they expect me to keep an eye out for him. Well... The raven starts to say something, and then you are all deafened by a massive sound emanating from the center of the city. It chills you to your bones, and your vision starts to blur a little bit as the vitreous humor in your eyes vibrates with the frequency. You feel this cry in your soul. It is the crowing of a mighty rooster. Well, that certainly answers that question, then. After a moment, the deafening sound subsides, and there's silence across the entirety of the city. The raven says, well, shit. Okay. Well, good luck. Um, the raven flies off. Good luck with what? I, I scream after him as he departs. He yells, Ragnarok! <sighs> oh, dear. In New York City, of all places. The wind kicks up a little bit, and there's definitely a chill in it now. It's July, and things shouldn't be this cold. But within a few seconds, you can see icicles slowly tracing their way off some of the rooftops, and you can see frost patterns forming on the windows of Emmanuel's opulent apartment. 
Is this the first time Ragnarok has been um, started? No. Take it, this is a common occurrence. Oh, often orchestrated by my father. Well, forgive me, Sigrun. Was it something to do with Ragnarok? Ragnarok. I, I saw a film about that. Uh, something to do with uh, all the dead are going to have a big fight? I mean, I don't think that's how it works at all. The end of the world, yes. Yes. Sigrun, you know that uh, whatever's going on, it can probably be stopped. The true Ragnarok will only occur when Gulen Kambi um, emanates his crow in uh, Valhalla itself and wakes the heroes of the dead from their slumber. I think someone is trying to scare us a bit. I guess we got a rooster to find. Well, I don't know about you, but all this sounds frightfully irritating, so let's see. Well, hang on a minute. I snap my fingers and call one of my many, many retinue. One of your retinue immediately snaps to your side. Um, Not even a second passes by between the moment you make a single hand gesture and the person at your side. Even with the fine cut suits that all of your retinue are... Uh, wearing, you can see the faint bulges and outlines of weaponry under their jackets. Um, each of them has a, a small earpiece uh, to maintain contact with one another. Of course, it is a glossy black, and all of them are wearing shades. You know that many of them have elaborate tattoos uh, marking them as eagle warriors. That I do, after all. They are my very, very loyal retainers. And they are very good at what they do. But I'm not exactly searching for one of them right now. I'm thinking to myself as I twirl my very immaculate, bronzed, black moustache. Could you go and fetch the phone for the Elder? I'd like her opinion on what's going on. This is, of course, my interesting elder, Elder Nahual, who is an expert calendar reader and decryptor of various agents and fates and futures and lots of things I don't really know very much about, because I don't pay attention. The Eagle Warrior bows and then um, steps back. He produces a glossy black cellular phone, just a a smartphone, uh, makes a few taps on it, He holds the phone to his ear, and he speaks in a soft voice, uh, almost too soft for you to hear. You wait for the better part of a minute, and then he takes a knee in front of you and offers the phone up to you. Oh, I've told you there's no need for that when I'm in company. I look a little... Well, I pretend to look embarrassed, but the two of you know I'm not embarrassed at all. Forgive me, Obsidian Lord. Oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Just go in, uh, give me 20. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so anyway, pass the phone. Um, he retreats into the bedroom to start doing the 20 push-ups you have ordered. And on the phone, I look at the other two saying, right, well, first things first, maybe we could try finding where this bird is. I don't know anyone better than my, you know, friend. Maybe if you could stop blabbering i could actually see if i can sense which way it came from oh you know me sigrun i can't stop babbling i smile (laughs) i uh finish my dry martini and i get up and produce a small uh, scope out of my pocket and i simply walk out on the balcony and start looking about for this rooster that we're looking for sigrun that will be probably another occult role i would say it's occult and, and cunning trying to hunt down the the source of this Rashmi, how do you want to search for this? Simply looking over the city, seeing where it looks like there's some action going on? Initially, I'm looking mostly to see if the whatever is happening is happening close by. But if I don't spot anything, I suppose it will simply have to... Uh, uh, I don't really know. Is this the highest point of the building? Uh, Just about, yes. Oh, there, well. is, there is, of course, a roof to the, to the top you're in, but you're in the penthouse. Well, if I don't spot it from here, I hardly think I would spot it from the rooftops, but, um, hmm. I would say that your firearms gives you, um, some experience as a sniper. 
mm-hmm. which means you have some experience as a spotter as well. So why don't, you, why don't you give me a firearms and cunning roll? Six successes, one of them being a ten. Uh, please re-roll that. Oh, understood. That is a eight. So that will be seven successes then. Beats my two then, by far. <laughs> well, this is one thing that I'm good at. I'm sure, Sigrun, that once the fighting starts, you will be taking the lead for us. Mm, I hope we don't have to fight. Knowing your kind, I'm sorry, that's horribly... Uh, knowing uh, the Norse mythology, I'm assuming that fighting is a rather large part of it, isn't it? Not if you can trick them. That's true, that's, that's very fair. My apologies for being insensitive. Hmm. Rashmi, as you spy over the city with the small scope, uh, probably taking off a fairly heavy rifle, you can see cars beginning to spin out on the street a little bit. As another cold wind whips up, uh, you see the faint glint of uh, black ice forming all over the asphalt. Sigrun, you pick out a skyscraper that looks unfinished in the middle of New York. It looks like it's being built or perhaps rebuilt. Uh, the upper floors are nothing but dagged, uh, jagged daggers of iron stabbing up into the sky. But you can see that between those spikes of iron there are heavy amounts of frost forming huge walls of ice and as another cold wind kicks up you can see snow starting to fall over parts of the city I just uh, nod and grunt and then turn around and start towards the door Emmanuel um, you're Nahual speaks to you on the phone and asks what the Obsidian Lord would ask of them. Well, friend, uh, we seem to be having a small little uh, possible world-ending catastrophe happening here in New York. I don't suppose you've not seen anything in the old bones. Uh, I, if so, I'd really like to know. I have read the stars, and I have read the signs, and I know that the world does not end this day. This is not the day the fifth sun goes out. Oh, well, that's reassuring, but then what do we do about the little thing that's going on right here? I'm seeing icicles forming in New York. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that's quite unusual. I see your path taking you into the lands of the dead. I see you in a strange and foreign land to you. Some place where we do not tread. Hmm. I actually sound a little serious for the first time. I'm not going to have to die again to go to the lands of the dead, am I? You know I don't like dying. There are many ways to get to the lands of the dead. Not all of them involve dying. Well, if I do need to die, it's only a temporary inconvenience. Uh, very well then. Uh, good job. I keep telling you that we're on the phone. You don't need to be so serious all the time. I apologize? You should. Next time, let me know how you're doing. Anyway, I've got to go. I imagine... Uh, I see Sigrun leaving. My compatriots are always very impatient, as always, as always. Goodness me. If I hang up, I'm going to go over to Rashmi and say, Well, Sigrun obviously can't wait, but it turns out that hopefully the world isn't actually ending. It's still not very good what's going on, but it might not be world ending, at least. Hopefully. That's certainly a relief to hear. But we might need to... uh, pay a little trip to the lands of the dead or at least that's what's going to happen you know how fate Mm. casters are (laughs) i see well then you would be intimately familiar with those lands would you not yes as you know it's been a few times i've visited there especially last time remember (laughs) i literally lost my head (laughs) yes of course i do remember that one rather nasty business should i bring something aside from my gun of course well, let's see. Let's go and meet Sigrun downstairs. And as I go, I again do a couple of clicks that let my warriors know I want cars downstairs ready to drive us all to wherever we need to go. I'm, of course, just wearing a high-waisted business suit pants and a white blouse, even despite the cold. It doesn't actually bother me at all. After all, I've got the divine fire of my, uh, my uh, patron flowing through me. So I'll just... Simply take the keys of my rifle and follow after you. You all proceed to the center of the disturbance. You all walk through the city to the skyscraper that's forming in frost. 
As you walk outside, you gasp a little as the wind picks up, wisps of steam coming from your mouths like spurting blood. Rashmi, Emmanuel, you are relatively unbothered, but Sigrun, somewhere deep in your wooden soul, you can feel the frost and you know it's a killing frost. Above you, the sky darkens. Storm clouds roll in and heavy amounts of snow fall from the sky. How did I get here? Did I bring a car or something? Because I'm, I'm thinking I might need a a jacket or something. I'm not sure Sigrun actually has a driver's license. I don't think so either, actually. She, she was a tree. She sort of skipped that milestone. Mm, I think so as well. She probably just walks everywhere. Most likely. You probably have a uh, all-purpose traveling cloak that you sort of are huddling tightly in right now. Yeah. Holding you fast against the cold. Yeah, I'm dr- I draw it a bit closer to keep the cold out as well. Um, and um, I take it I have my weapons? Uh, yes, you do. You all have your weapons on you. Yeah, good, good. I kind of wait um, as I uh, exit the, the the building where Emmanuel lives and I kind of wait for the others to catch up with me as I try to draw the cloak closer um, over my shivering body. Mm. Well, as I come out, I once again am directing several people behind me to get in vehicles, get vehicles ready. I don't leave anywhere without my large retinue, after all. Uh, but I do look to Shime as I say, Ah, this doesn't look very good at all, does it? No, no, it really does not. Uh, I'm sorry, are you cold? Well, I, I'm i fine, but um, Sigrun, my, my my good person, are you all right? You look a little, little cold there. Yes, it it is getting colder all the time. I, I might need something, a jacket or something. I could conjure up a flame if you'd like, Bo. Uh, I don't like flames at all. I rather keep far from them. My apologies. How, how insensitive of me. I could try to heat. I can only really heat a room, but if you're inside a vehicle, that shouldn't be a problem. I, I think I will be able to manage. Don't, don't worry too much. Rashmi, I believe you have dominion over fire. Is that true? Oh, that is correct, yes. Dominion over fire. So... Dominion boons are something that demigods get that heroes do not, and it represents a fundamental link and a oneness with an aspect of the world. When a god says, I am the god of the sun, dominion means they literally are the sun, that that is actually them. It is indistinguishable from them. So on a deep spiritual level, you are fire. You just are. I see. That's... Well, would that mean that I could be able to warm up the air around Sigrun? Absolutely. You can absolutely warm the temperature of an area like that by several degrees with but a gesture. Hmm. I should make it a comfortable 21, 22 degrees Celsius. Sigrun, uh, the air immediately warms around you until it's a very comfortable, almost room temperature. Uh, the what ice and snow was forming on your cloak simply turns to water and starts melting off. I turn towards Rashmi, cock my head a bit to the side, and I I take it you're the one to thank? Well, I couldn't stand watching you freeze like that, my dear. My apologies, I can certainly end it if it's bothering you. No, it is good. Tack. Emmanuel, one of your eagle warriors comes up to you and says, Sire, the cars are ready, but it looks like there's a heavy amount of traffic and ice is starting to form in the area around there. <sighs> I understand. Well, I say this to the others. Perhaps it's best we take one vehicle and then the rest of the vehicles... Don't rush all at once. Do your best to stay safe and follow us. If you can't, then I understand if some of you need to withdraw for the moment. But for the moment, let's all get in... One of you get in my car and drive all three of us. And uh, let's begin heading towards this uh, delightful icicle building. 
<laughs> or maybe we could just walk. Walk, Sigrun. What have we? T- we've spoken about this in the past. You and the walking. But it takes you where you need to go. Very slowly. The four of you take a car. The one eagle warrior driver, and the three of you. Of course, Emmanuel, you get the shotgun position. Yes, I do, and I sit back, and as I'm leaning back in the car, I, I try and gauge, like, how far would it have been if we actually had walked? I'm pretty sure it would have been a longer journey, right? Probably about four or five city blocks, so a, a good walk. You see, Sigrun, this is much faster, plus we're comfortable in here, plus, you know, uh, Roberto here is a wonderful driver, aren't you, Roberto? Roberto jumps onto the sidewalk in order to avoid the traffic jams and honks his horn. Most of the people seem to be fleeing the area anyway, so there's not too many people to honk at, but he does it anyway. I think we have different definitions of a good driver. I simply smile, quite enjoying the uh, excitement of a good drive. The car flicks on its headlights uh, as you roar through the city streets and sidewalks. Within a few short minutes, you are in front of 9 DeKalb Avenue, the skyscraper you are going to. And as you exit the vehicle, your shoes make soft crunching noises on the fresh powdery snow. In the swirling flakes through the low-hanging fog against a pitch-black sky, the skyscraper stands a silent sentinel, the lit and heated lower floors contrasted by the flare of lamps shining through the bare superstructure on the upper levels. You can see the columns of light in the night. A standing sign on the street, glowing LED screen shining through the thin layer of frost, lists a series of upcoming events. The most current one is Christmas in July. Well, as the car comes up and we all start getting out, I'll say to the others. So, anyone have any ideas how we find what we actually need in this building rather than going for every single floor? Sigrun, when you uh, tried to locate the source of things earlier, you definitely got a sense it was on a level with you. So you should probably head to the upper floors. Hmm. I um, motion towards the top and just, I don't say anything, just point. Oh, very good, very good. Uh, Rashmi, do you think we're going to need to do something about the cold? Are you ready just in case? Yeah, well, certainly. How much would you like me to do? I can clear out rather a big area of it. Well, let's, uh, hmm. Well, I suppose if you do any property damage, I'll cover it for the building. <laughs> but maybe don't set the whole building on fire. If certainly not. My fire is precise. Well, well aimed. And I, I smile and give a well-meaning tap on the back because, you know, I'm just teasing. I really don't see the difference from when you're teasing and not, but uh, I do appreciate the gesture. Shall we go? Yes, uh, Sigrun, by all means, lead the way. You walk past bodies, preserved in pallid color by a thin blanket of ice. People wearing shorts, wearing business suits. People just walking their dogs. Are they dead? Most likely. How unfortunate. I look to uh, my eagle warriors... How are they doing? Are they all right, or are they getting cold? Well, um, the rest of your Eagle Warriors have pulled up. Um, They are... uh, The cars are heated, thankfully, with heated seats, a very lovely feature that you paid for. But they are chilly out here. You should get inside as fast as you can. All right, you lot, stay together. Don't stay out in the cold. Uh, Yes, I don't think there's anything we can do for them. Rush me, I'm sorry. Hmm. Well, we can certainly avenge them, can't we? That we can. And I carefully follow Sigrun and Rashmi into the building. One of your eagle warriors does a quick scan of the building and speaks to the very frightened security guard uh, sitting in the central console of the entryway. Uh, You see the lobby of the skyscraper has ceilings at least 30 feet high done in a marble temple style that would make the theoi the greco-roman gods proud 11 massive columns stretch floor to ceiling in a circle in the center of the room just past the entrance the security guard speaks to your eagle warrior who then nods and goes over to you 
Emmanuel, and he says, Sire, it appears that floors 15 above are under construction, and the elevators will only stop at that floor. Well, that's certainly a conundrum, isn't it, uh, Sigrun? We can walk the rest of the way? The Eagle Warrior nods. The stairs should be clear up to floor 60, the top floor. Well, very well then. Well, no observed. I guess we're walking to... Well, we're taking the lift and then we're walking. Finally, you're going to get some walking, Sigrun. I smile. It'll be good for your cardio. You take the elevator up to the 50th floor, but as you start to pass floor 47, it jerks to a sudden halt as most of the lights go dark for a split second and emergency lights flick on for a second. But the elevator does not continue moving. Well, this is troubling. Sigrun, I suppose you can get us out of this lift, can you? By prying up the doors, or...? Well, you know, use your amazing powers of intuition. I do have something... A boon. Epic strength. Is that something I can use? Yes, epic strength is one of your purviews, and you have a boon called Pistons for Fists that's part of that. Um, and generally, that's generally, um, that's one of the boons that's more meant for direct damage as opposed to, mm-hmm. uh, r- you know, ripping and tearing huge things. But if you'd like, you can spend a point of legend, you have five, um, to grant yourself scale through your epic strength. And that will allow you to uh, rend apart virtually anything. At five, your scale should be three, and since you have the epic strength boon, for the purposes of actually uh, lifting or ripping things, you operate at scale four, which effectively means you could lift a small aircraft carrier. It shouldn't be a problem, then, uh, to get the doors open. Actually, you don't even have to spend a point of legend, honestly. Um, you, you have the, the plus one scale you punch your fingers into the space between the door and the metal simply folds as if it were soft butter. With a single flick of your wrists, you throw the doors wide open. You are between floors, it looks like, and you can drop down to the lower one on the 46th floor. But it will be a walk the rest of the way. Your eagle warriors, Emmanuel, um, are getting out of fellow uh, fellow elevators that were stuck at various places. It will take them a small amount of time to catch up with you entirely, to regroup. Do you want to wait for them, or do you want to continue? Well, I probably should wait for my dear companions, but uh, perhaps Sigrun or Rashmi, we could scout ahead, see what's going on. Sigrun, uh, the, 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 the cockerel, uh, the rooster, is its purview ice? Is this something it normally does? Do you know? Good question. Um, is that something I know? The ones who would have frost-related powers are known as the Jotun, or the ice giants. I, I turn to you and I say, mm, I don't think that Gulen Combi uh, has anything to do with ice, but we do have the frost giants... Jutun. Hmm. Well, that doesn't sound very pleasant, but then again, Rashmi, maybe you can just give them a warm welcome. <laughs> Do you see what I did there? <laughs> yes, very droll. Would there be more than one frost giant, or are there just one? Just one? No, they usually come huh, small armies, I take it, I, oh, I think. A pity. <laughs> very well, I will prepare my rifle. Just kind of unshoulder the um, the uh, carriage that I have my rifle in, and I start uh, basically just putting it together, checking the sights. Uh, your rifle snaps together in um, in uh, well oiled and uh, tightly machined parts. Um, you take excellent care of it, of course. So, did I hear that you were scouting ahead or waiting? I have lay of the land. Is would that be applicable here? If I imbue one legend, I can actually ask you. It's it's about wilderness areas, but to me, a city is still wild. You know, it wouldn't work here, but it would work on the upper floors where 
where it's still unformed for the most part. A, a strange distinction at best, I know. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I'm good to wait here for a moment, Sigrun, if you want to go and scout ahead. Or we can all wait. I'm easy going. I believe I will join Sigrun. I think we all should hurry, uh, Emmanuel. If the best you can do is wait, then it's up to you. I believe the best I can do is wait. After all, it's irresponsible of me to leave those who I've brought with me. So you go ahead, you go ahead. I'll be right with you with those reinforcements. If they don't fight, they will not come to Valhalla. You know that. Oh, don't worry. They'll be fighting. In the elevator? Where they get out of the... El oh, my goodness, Sigrid. You are a magnificent being, but sometimes... Uh. Are you two finished? Oh, I have that. You two go on ahead, honestly. I'll catch right up. All right. <laughs> Rashmi and Sigrun, you both go ahead. Uh, Emmanuel, you wait behind. The painting on the stairs stops somewhere around the 50th floor. Everything else up above there is bare. And the air gets noticeably colder as you're out of the heated part of the building. Even though heat rises, it's definitely very chilly and poorly insulated up here. You continue climbing. Stair after stair after stairwell until you reach the 65th floor, which seems to be as far up as you can go. Everything up above is scaffolding and metal parts. You walk out of the stairs out into the open air. You can see the tall steel girders stretching high into the sky all around you. It's a little weird that the top upper floor is completely unfinished, but here you are. The area around you is completely encased in ice. And it makes walking around a little bit treacherous. Unless, of course, Rashmi, you want to melt the ice. I suppose I could try to melt the ice at least around our feet, if that's possible. All right. Um, you create a small halo uh, of flame around your body, uh, and you both sink down about half an inch onto solid ground. Well, stay close to me, Sigrun, and I believe we shall be fine for now. Do you think you could teach me that trick? Certainly. I thought you were not very fond of flames. Flames and heat are not uh, always the same thing. Emmanuel, the last of your eagle warriors, finally joins you. But as you're standing there, you hear the groaning of the superstructure of the building. It's already getting colder here, it, it, despite the immense amount of heat. Well, I'm glad you're all here. From this point on, be careful, stick together, make sure you don't get too cold, and follow me. And I will begin leading my retinue to follow after the others. Okay, there's about 20 to 25 uh, per people in your retinue, I believe. Does that sound about right? That sounds about right to me, yes. Emmanuel and his core of trained warriors uh, ascend the floors. Rashmi and Sigrun, uh, you walk forward to the center of the structure. And there you see, uh, sitting on what looks like a makeshift throne made out of pallets of wood and construction materials, is... A huge man swaddled in furs. As he, you approach him, he sights you, and then he stands, and you see he's at least 18, maybe 20 feet tall. His skin has a slight bluish tinge, and he has long blonde hair. Do I know who this is? Uh, please give me an occult plus intellect roll. And I have a Norse... Uh, specialty in... Yes, you do. Five, actually. Five success. Five successes is enough to tell you that this is probably Old Valdi. Um, he's a Jotun, uh, the father of Theasi. He is rich in gold, and when he died, his sons were to divide their inheritance. They measured out the gold, and they divided it by each taking a mouthful, all of them the same number. And, um... You know that reincarnation works oddly among the Jotun and among the Aesir. 
and it's not uncommon for a famous figure to die and then simply reappear later and then possibly die again until the final death in Ragnarok of everything that lives. I um, I stand tall, as tall as I can. Um, I'm a, just a very non that uh, imposing figure next to uh, Ulvadi, but um, I stand as tall as I can, of course, and I raise my voice, hoping that he will be able to hear me. And I call to him, Ulvadi, what brings you here? It is not time. He strides forward to you and he says, Loki's daughter, is that you? I, I actually cringe a little when he says uh, Loki's name, uh, but I... Um, some claim that I am, yes? He laughs. It's a booming, echoing laugh that's only muted by the strange ice all around you. He says, the rooster has crowed. It is time for Fimblewinter to come upon this land. Behold, he gestures beside the throne and out shuffles a snow-encrusted rooster, a roughly six feet tall. Is this... Valhalla. The uh, the rooster shakes its head and, and uh, opens its mouth, and the giant simply, you know, brushes it aside just a little bit. He says, Gulen Kambi crows where he wants. That call was heard throughout all of the nine realms. It does not matter where from whence it emanates. Behold, he gestures around, the magic of this place... Very impressive. You've frozen this entire office building. Well, half of it. Soon this city shall be encased in ice, and then the world. Sigrun, is that how Ragnarok is supposed to happen? Everything just freezes? It's true. Fimba winter is the harsh winter that precedes the end of the world. It lasts for three successive winters, from where snow comes from uh, all directions. I uh, nod, and... uh... Yes, but this is not the place it's supposed to happen. And he knows that. The giant uh, rubs his palms together ever so slightly. And he says, gold in this world often comes from fire and iron. Wars, that's what makes the most amount of money here in this world. Then... Why are you eager for this world to end? The end of the world can be stretched out over a very long time. In that time, there will be innumerable wars over the resources of this cold and freezing planet. Plenty of opportunity to make more and more gold. It does strike you as a little odd that an ice giant is starting the end of the world for so venal a motive, but... You, you, you consider your mere mythology and you realize that this sort of thing does happen all the time. You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying where we played Scion, Demigod, which is published by our friends at Onyx Path Publishing and is on Kickstarter right now. Our game master was Neil Price and Craig was joined by Yeni Brembari and The Primogen. The music was created by Lisa Listvi and Mount Shrine and was used with permission from their label, Cryochamber. Visit cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for more music for your games. We would like to give massive thanks to our champions of the Red Moon, Martin Hoyshobert, Nastasha Rollerson, Simon Cooper, David, Julia and David Hogby for their generous support. And we would of course like to thank all of our other patrons. Without your support, the show would not be possible. If you want to support our work, please check us out on Patreon. You can get access to bonus campaigns for Cult of Any Lost and Coriolis there, as well as get early and raw access to all of our recordings. You can also hear your name read on the show as a champion of the Red Moon, as well as play Cult with us. Most importantly, that support is what keeps the show going, so do check us out there. Thank you for listening, and see you soon again.